Well, most of the time, it's hard to spot a lie. Um, <laughs> most of the time. I'm frozen up here again. I believe the sausage has actually frozen up the iPad. This is, this is a conspiracy here. Anyway, um, <laughs> if you played the game during breakfast or if you've seen us play it during the service, I got it back. Um, I just like to watch Raph run back and forth. Thank you very much. But, but uh, if you played the game or if you've seen us play the game during the service the last few weeks, it does prove one thing, that it's difficult to spot a lie. And, it, and it's funny because no one has a perfect score in Lieswater. And if I would have come up here a few weeks ago and just said, all of you believe lies, you might have thought I was being harsh or, or something. But, but it's just true. And so I want to talk to you about something that causes us to believe lies this morning that is difficult. And um, I hope your, all of your blood is not totally rushed to your stomach digesting those eggs because we're going to have to think today. But I think it's so important that we do so because it's not as simple as trivia when it comes to knowing a lie, when it comes to figuring out not just who's lying, but who's telling the truth. So I want to introduce you to a guy named Max Hastings, or actually because he's English and because he was knighted in 2002, we must call him Sir Max Hastings. But I heard an interview with him a few weeks ago that really just struck me and made me think of this thing we're going to talk about today. Now, sometimes I come up here and I sound I don't know if I sound that way, but I try to sound smart or interesting. Like, yeah, I was reading about the Peloponnesian War. I will tell you, I was actually interested in the Vietnam War because Jack and This Is Us was in the Vietnam War. And that just makes me pathetic, I know. Can't believe I watched that. And I can't believe that the most interesting person on the show and the most likable on the guy on the show is dead. Sorry for spoiling that for you. And still dead. But anyway, Jack had been to Vietnam, so I was interested in the Vietnam War, so I was listening to this, this podcast with Sir Max Hastings on it, and he said one of the most shocking things that I've ever heard a reporter say, because Max Hastings started his career um, as a war reporter, in fact, a very good war reporter. He reported for the BBC, uh, was in Vietnam at, from 72 till 75. He was on one of the last choppers out of Vietnam, actually. Um, that's a picture of him on, the, on your left-hand side um, while he was in Vietnam. And he said something that shocked me because he's writing a book, and this, this book that you see of Vietnam, um, actually, he just came out in September, 50 years basically after the war. And, and here's what he said that caught my attention. He said, I very much bought into the idea that not only was this a disastrous war, but because the United States was tied up with a bad cause, therefore the other side must be a good, uh, good cause. Now, you hardly ever hear a reporter or, or anyone in the media admit I was so wrong about something. Um, and he went on to say, and I put that up there, that's his exact quote, I put that up there so you would see, I don't want to just paraphrase it, but basically what he said is he saw the lie of the South Vietnamese, and he saw the lie of the American government, what they were saying was not correct and was not what was actually happening. And he saw abuses on the side of the Americans, but because of that, he thought, well, I guess the communists are great then. I guess if the Americans leave, things will be great. And he said, thanks to time, um, he's been able to understand like he didn't understand the war at all. Not that it changed what he saw, not that it changed the abuses he saw or the, or the horrors that he saw or the lies that he heard that he understood was lies, but he realized that what came next was even worse. And he went on to talk about how I think over 800,000 people were executed in North Vietnam after um, the communists took over, and then 1.2 million people starved when they, private, or they uh, took away the farms and gave them to soldiers who had never farmed before, and that often happens when you do that, take away the farm. And so over 2 million people were displaced and moved to other countries because the starvation was so terrible, and it's just this terrible thing. And he said, I was shocked by that because I was certain that the problem was South Vietnam, and when North Vietnam took over, everything would be fine. And here's a guy in late in his life saying, 
I just want to tell you that I completely misunderstood this war and I was a reporter. Now, what, what made me think is like, oh my goodness, here's a guy who knew more about this conflict than anybody else. I mean, he was there. We, I was barely born. It, that makes me feel good about this. I hardly ever get to say that, but like I was a baby, but the people that were alive then weren't there unless they were in the military. And even, even our, you know, our legislators, they hadn't seen what was going on, but Max actually did. And he still managed to believe a lie. Um, and it was serious. And, and, and I was thinking that, I was like, wow, what if seeing a lie doesn't necessarily mean you see the truth and that somehow like we have these blinders on and, and what is it that causes us to miss the truth or to believe a lie? And then I saw this story last week, a really sad story. This is Jamal Robertson and he died two weeks ago. There was a shooting at the club that he was working at. It was Manny's Blue Room Lounge near Chicago, and he was working as a security guard there. There was a shooting. From what we know, and, and I take this with a grain of salt, but from what we know, he, he um, behaved very heroically. He actually stopped a shooter who shot three people and had him on the ground with his own gun on him when he was shot by the police. And that's just heartbreaking. But, but I was thinking about that, like people said, oh, here we go again. The police love to shoot people, especially black men. And I thought, maybe not. I mean, can you imagine anything you'd rather not do as a, as a police officer today, like to start your shift with a career and a future, a dangerous future maybe, but as a state policeman, which is a pretty difficult thing to become. And by the end of the day, you're like a murder suspect and you're, a, uh, you know, many people are talking about you and just, it would just ruin your life. Like, I think that would be the last thing you would wanna do, but yet, we know this police officer rolled up on the scene and because he thought he knew who the gunman was and he saw Jamal like over someone with a gun, he shot and killed this young man who was only 26 years old. Man, I was thinking about that, like this idea that sometimes what we think we know is really dangerous. Sometimes what we think we know, like in this case, like he thought he knew who the shooter was and ended up killing the wrong person. It was terrible. And, and, and in Max's story, like he thought he knew how the war was going and he thought like there's a good guy and a bad guy so these guys are the bad guys so they must be good and then he found out later like he said later he said it was basically a war between two tyrannies and I was caught in the middle and I think most of us can relate to that maybe not in those senses thank God but I think we can relate to things that like we think we know something and then it actually causes us to believe a lie. Last week we were up here and, and the question came up about how many Volkswagens were sold in America their first year. And I was like, yes, I know this. I know this. I own old Volkswagens. I've studied a lot about their history. I have a lot of history with air-cooled Volkswagens. Like, I know this and I got it wrong because I didn't know what I thought I knew. And that's difficult. And it's something we should think about um, because here's another thing we should think about that just because we spot a lie, it doesn't guarantee that we know the truth, right? Like we could go, that's a lie. You know, I know in Max's case, he said, I knew the government wasn't telling the truth about this war, but it didn't mean that he knew the truth. And so we come down to these two words that I used to think were the same things. This is where I am old, but I'm actually learning. Did you know that assumptions and presumption is not the same thing? It just seemed like it was sort of interchangeable and maybe you used presumption if you assumpted first. I, I don't know. <laughs> and I knew the thing about assuming was it makes something of you and me, but I can't remember what that was. So I was like, what is the difference? There's actually a difference. I, I found this out this week and so I'll pass it on. Here's your trivia for today. When you assume something, it's like you think something is true with no evidence. When you presume something, it means you have some evidence, but both can still be wrong. Like if you hear a noise outside, and you think it's raccoons and you've never seen a raccoon in your yard, you're assuming it's a raccoon. I'm saying that because we have raccoons in the church this morning. Not, not right now, don't freak out, but there is somewhere, there's a raccoon that has been breaking into the church. But if you have, <laughs> so in our case, if there's something destroyed in the church, I would presume it's the raccoon and not the youth group. Um, but if I had never seen 
a raccoon in the church, then I would just be assuming. So it, but both of them could be wrong because it's definitely the youth group. They destroy every, no, I'm sorry. You guys are cool. That's a, but, but here's the thing. So, so we can actually totally miss the truth because of what we assume or what we presume or what we think we know. And so I think we should take some time this morning and, and we're gonna have to think together because this is difficult and this is not gonna be easy and this is not gonna be sort of cut and paste and here's three rules and then you'll know. It's something we need to work through because man, can you imagine getting to the end of your life? You know, Max says, I'm a guy who's written books about wars. He's a, he's, I, I, I'm the most respected journalist in this area and I was wrong. Or can you imagine even worse, the policeman somewhere going, man, I shot the wrong guy. I thought I knew. Like, I never would have done it if I would have thought. So here's a lie that maybe we can see through as Christians this morning. And I'm speaking to Christians. If you're not a Christian this morning, you're so welcome. And we're glad you're here. And you're probably the most open-minded person I know to listen to someone like me. But, but a lie that we often hear in our world and that people believe is just everything is random and nothing has a reason. It's just, in fact, I was watching a movie last night and one of the characters said that because it's believed in our side. Everything's random. It's just, it happened to you, but nothing matters. Nothing has a reason. There's no one controlling it. So as Christians, we would go, no, that's, that's a lie because God created this thing and God set these things in motion and God is in control. We say that, we throw that around. But what does that mean? Um, everything happens for a reason and we can understand what the reason is. Try that on, that's difficult. I don't know what the reason things happen. And so we come down to this moment. We come down to this moment that many of us struggle with this whole idea of things happening for a reason, for God's plan, God being in control, and what does that entail? And does that mean, and so a couple of models that we use, um, some people say, well, God's kind of a watchmaker. God built this, this universe, and it's like a watch, and he sort of wound it up, and he lets it go. And so the reason why things happen that we don't like, or the reason why disasters happen, or, or the reason why people are die, or, or good people die, or good people are sick, or I mean, I know a family right now, one of the best families I know, and their son was hit by a car, and their daughter was diagnosed with cancer, and her dad just died, and you just go, how can that happen to one of the nicest families I know? So some people would say, well, God is a watchmaker. God built this place. God created this place. And then he wound it up and he kind of let it go. And so he's not really involved in the day-to-day -day anymore. Now, other people think of it like, now, we used to say God is a puppet master, but that just, that doesn't help because we don't know what a puppet master is. <laughs> Sounds like something from heavy metal. But anyway, um, God, I would say like the other side of that is some people treat God like he's playing Game Boy, like we're in a simulation and we're the characters. And God just, even though we don't know, like we're just, he's just driving us around in this, in this game and he's in control of everything. And like every time your toaster breaks, it's God out to get you or it's Satan, you know, persecuting you. And you kind of go back and forth and you meet people like that that see purpose in everything. Even like you're like, dude, I just think that just happened. Maybe <laughs> I'm saying, you know, so, so we come into sort of these two things, but they're both, they're both incorrect. They're both, it's not that God has sort of walked away and left this universe, at least according to scripture that we're gonna talk our way through. But it's also not that God is behind everything and you're not, because there's free will and free will messes everything up. And so I wanna read to you something from the prophet Isaiah. And I think it gives us such a sort of a unique op opportunity this morning because the one thing about the Old Testament prophets that I love is that they were God's spokesmen. There was a time, now through Jesus, the Bible says that we can approach God directly. We can just pray to God directly, thankfully. Um, but in that time, you had to go to the temple to pray or you had to go through a priest and then God actually sent spokesmen, prophets who would speak for him. But I think that's super helpful because we kind of get to hear what God thinks. And I wanna read this to you because it's powerful. In Isaiah 55, it says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts 
are higher than your thoughts. So God says, there's no way you're gonna figure out what I'm up to. There's no way you're gonna know because like in this sense, they go heavens are above, but basically the way you should look at heaven and earth, and if you look at it in the way we think of today, we wouldn't go, it's up there because that's the sky, but we would say in this other dimension, God's in another dimension that we can't see, it's above us or through us, and then his ways are from that dimension and our thoughts are from this dimension and they're never going to match. Like the way God thinks, and, and just take away, we're talking this morning, we're having this conversation with Kate, like about how God thinks so much differently. Just take away, if everything was the same, if we could think like God, but you take away the fact that we're finite and we die in 50, 70, 90 years, tops, you know, it, it's amazing to think how much different God is than us because he doesn't have that timeline. Like if I said, oh, I'm gonna become a medical doctor, and I'm 20, you go, well, that's possible. At 50, you'd go, you better get busy, old man. It could happen, but probably not. And once I get to about 70, you know, you go, I'm sorry, you're not going to be a medical doctor. You better hope you get an honorary doctor. Like you might start donating money to a college. I mean, because, because we would think of that way, but if I were 50 years old and I were God and I was gonna live forever and I said, I'm gonna be a medical doctor, I'd be no closer or further away from that goal than anything because it could happen any time. And so God's ways, just on that plane alone, are so much different than us. So I wanna talk through a simple story that gets really complicated. Um, now, maybe you've heard this story because this will help us, I think, at least I've been using it to sort of help me think through this problem. This is the story of Jonah. You might know this story. You might have had the toys when you were a kid. You might have seen the veggie tale. It's a story that has a... It doesn't really have a whale. It says giant fish, but if you say whale, that's fine. I don't mind. It's crazy either way. But it's, it's a pretty simple story. I even went and got the Bible maps. That's, that's old school, right? Like, I got the Bible map so you could see what was happening. If you notice, like, <clears throat> this little spot down here, A, that's, that's Judah and Jerusalem. That's where Jonah's from. And God comes to Jonah, and he says, I want you to go to Nineveh, which, if you notice, is not that far away by land. And Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrians, and the Assyrians are the major power on the face of the earth at that point. They're bigger than Egypt. They're way bigger than Jerusalem. Babylon hasn't come on the scene. These guys are known for, if you read the history of the Assyrians, they're the first sort of storm troopery, this is a very technical term, storm troopery fighters. Like they just sort of marched up. They were to said to be like locusts. Like 100,000 of these guys would march across your land and show up. And we find in the Bible different places where they would show up and just take siege of a city. And after the people finally came up, they would just burn everything down, tear everything down. And whereas the Babylon were more likely to kidnap people and take them back and they had a plan and that they were just like locusts. They just destroyed everything and walked away. Um, so obviously, I'm certain Jonah was not super happy to get this assignment like, go tell the people of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians, that in 40 days I'm gonna destroy their city. That was the word from God. So Jonah did what doesn't seem too crazy when you think about who the Assyrians were. He was like, I'm gonna go, if God says to go to Nineveh, I'm going the opposite direction. So you see on the other side, the little C, that's Tarshish, which we think might be a, an, an ancient word for Carthage, actually. They think he's probably going, heading toward Carthage, which is all the way across the Mediterranean Sea. Now, it's not that far by our standing. I mean, it's hundreds of miles, but, but at that time, that was like as far away from Nineveh as you could imagine going. Basically, it was like <laughs> if I said, go to Miami and tell them they will be judged, you go, I need a ticket to Seattle. It was literally like, I'm gonna go the opposite direction. So the story goes that, <clears throat> and this is, the, this is the, the Bible school story, the one you got in Sunday school. Jonah gets in the ship and he gets somewhere out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea and God sends a giant storm. And at that point, the sailors start freaking out and for some reason, I, I don't know if he took Ambien, but Jonah's asleep in the bottom of the boat and the, the, the captain comes down there and is like, what are you sleeping for? Get up and pray to your God because we're about to die up here. We've already thrown all the cargo overboard and it's a terrible storm and Jonah's like, ugh, small problem. So Jonah admits to the people, hey, I think that I might be the problem here because see, I'm a prophet and God told me to go there and I went the opposite direction, so I might be. So it turns out that the sailors actually, and he said, you should throw me overboard. 
and I think it would fix your problem. Now, the sailors actually really didn't want to do that, which surprises me. I'd be like, okay, <laughs> I mean, we threw everything else over. Let's try this. But they actually didn't want to do that. So they went as far as like drawing straws. They drew lots. They literally gave everybody a straw and Jonah came up with a short straw. They were like, oh, this really is the problem. So they did throw Jonah overboard. He sinks down to the bottom of the ocean. He thinks he's dying. And then God sends a big fish to swallow him up. Jonah spends three days in this fish's belly. This is the quickie version of it, but this is what the Bible basically says. <laughs> and then the fish vomits him up, which is great to say, over on the beach, over by, by Israel again. He goes to Nineveh, and for some reason, they believe him when he says in 40 days, um, your nation will be destroyed. Maybe, and this is a weird theory, but I, I, th I hope it's true because that would be so funny. We do know that the Assyrians were famous for worshiping Dagon, which is a giant fish. So they worshiped a fish. Maybe they heard this guy came out of a giant, well, this guy was like vomited up by a giant fish. We should listen to him. I don't know if that's true, but it would be a great story. But anyway, they listen to him, they repent, and Jonah actually gets mad because he's like, I knew you were going to do that, God. You forgave them, and I hate that idea. So that, that's the story of Jonah. Now, I know it's a crazy story. <laughs> and I know when you read that, you, you should probably ask this question, like, is this a true story? Or can we assume or presume it's a true story? Here's, here's the reason why I would say, because there's lots of stuff in the Bible, or not lots of stuff, but there are things in the Bible that are parables, that are, that, are, that are stories about things. So is this a real story? Well, here's two things we do know about Jonah that I think are important. Um, in 2 Kings, it talks about Jeroboam II, the king, and we know from archaeology that guy existed. Uh, it said, Jeroboam too recovered the territories of Israel between Lebo, Hamath, and the Dead Sea, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised through Jonah, son of Amittai. So Jonah is mentioned in the historical record of Israel, so it seems to be a, a real guy. And then, if you're a Christian this morning and you believe what Jesus says, and that's the only way to be a Christian, it says, for as Jonah, Jesus used Jonah as an object lesson. He said, for as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man, what Jesus called himself, be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And I know you go, yeah, but I have trouble believing that. I get it. It's supernatural. If you're sort of keeping score, I think it's easier to believe that a guy was in a fish alive for three days than dead for three days in the center of the earth and came back. That's even more difficult to believe. So as Christians, I would say we, we listen to this story like it's a real story. Now, now, here's the problem with that. I mean, it's fun to just tell it as, oh, this is a story we tell our kids, or hey, maybe this is a parable, or hey, maybe this happened. Maybe No, but if you take this as a real story, which I do, it gets difficult because we start to use this and go, oh, well, then I understand how God works. Let me give you an example, and you've probably heard this. I've, I've heard people say this to you. It's this idea, well, when you disobey, God sends a storm, right? I mean, it happened to Jonah. I mean, Jonah was doing the wrong thing. He's running from God, so God sent a storm. So, so often in life, you will have good-hearted people who think they know the truth, and you're going through something really difficult, and they go, well, are you doing something wrong? Are you, are you disobeying God? And they try to find something wrong in your life when you're going through difficult things, um, sort of like Job's friends did. But that's a lie. It's not necessarily true that if you're disobeying God, God will send a storm. Because if you think about it, Paul, the apostle, was shipwrecked four times trying to do what God asked him to do. And, and Job, the guy who was the most righteous man supposedly on the earth, had the worst life for a long while, and he was doing exactly what. So we can't take from that that, oh, if, I, if things are going bad, I must be disobeying God. Now, you quite well may be, but that may not even be connected. Here, here's another one. People say this, like, well, you know, and, and we like to think this, and I want to think this, like, well, then Jonah repented. Like, actually, Jonah didn't repent until he got in the fish, so it sort of spoils that story, but we like that idea. So Jonah goes in the water. He's thrown into the, he's thrown into the water. Um, the sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. So actually, if we look at it this way, this is just God converting sailors by sending the storm, and they do a sacrifice of Jonah, and then they follow God. Um, 
But it's not true that when you repent, God necessarily recognized you. There's a story of Paul. Paul was shipwrecked, no fish. Paul was in the water for an entire day, basically clinging to a, a piece of wood, arrives on shore, makes a fire to warm himself by, and a poisonous snake comes out of the wood and bites him, and, and they're like, oh my goodness. In fact, the people on the island, it's a great story, <laughs> the people on the island said, oh, well, obviously he was a murderer. They thought the same thing that many of us think, like, oh, if you do something bad, well, God's gonna get you with a storm, or, but if you repent, God will rescue you, and we like to think that's true, and sometimes God does. It's a, this story happens exactly like that. I mean, there was no way Jonah was gonna live. It says God prepared a great fish, and I like the word prepared, because that means like he was ready with the fish before this even happened. Like, you don't build, grow, design. I don't know how you make a fish that quick. I guess God could do what he want, but it doesn't say that. It says that God was prepared. Here's another one. Throwing dice <laughs> or drawing straws is a good way to find out God's will. Um, that's what they did, right? Like they actually like wanted to find out like who's at fault among us. And so they Actually, that one might be true. Um, no, I'll tell you why. I think that, <laughs> I don't recommend it, but I'm saying this one actually might be true. You thought I was gonna say it's a lie. It might be true because that's how the priest used to decide things with the Urim and Thummim, I think. It was like they had two holy dice in the little pouch. They had like a, fanny, a holy fanny pack. I'm wrong about a lot of things, but basically the ephod was not, a, it was like a chess piece and it had two holy 11-sided dice or whatever, 12-sided dice in it, and they would throw them and use them to determine God's will. And the disciples, when they wanted to pick a new disciple after Judas uh, committed suicide, they drew straws, they cast lots. So I don't recommend this. I don't recommend you like spin or uh, magic eight ball it for God's will, but it works at times, I guess. Now, now here's another one that I actually like. Um, I love the fact that when God rescues the people of uh, Nineveh. <laughs> Notice what he says. He said, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? I love that picture of God, and, and it makes me understand how much God cares about. God has such an infinite ability to care for things. He's not only concerned about the people of Nineveh, and it's funny because Jonah was mad because he's like, these are wicked people. These are people who have killed people I know. These are, these are the worst people on the planet, and you're concerned about them, and God says to him, not just them, but the animals. I mean, I think that's great. Like, I care about their cattle as well. And so, here's the thing. Like, it gets very difficult when we try to take what we think we know about God and turn it into rules to live by, if you will. Um, here's another thing that you should think about. God controls everything. And, and here's where we get that idea that, hey, God is in control, then God controls everything. I want you to think about this. Like in, in verse um, four, it says, the Lord hurled a powerful wind, so God's controlling the wind. And then it says in, in verse 17, God arranged for a great fish. And then in 4.6, it says, then the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant. So he, he, he's not only like commanding the wind, he's commanding like leafy plants to grow. And then if you notice, he also sends a tiny little worm to eat the root. That, I mean, he's controlling everything. It says God also arranged for a worm. And the next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant, so it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, guess what? God sends another scorching east wind. So if you read that, it's pretty clear that God is in control of everything. Not true. He didn't control Jonah. Like, Jonah's the one who needs to be controlled, right? Jonah's sort of a pain in the butt, but God never controls him. God doesn't control the people of Assyria. Like, they choose to hear his warning. Um, and so here's the thing that'll really mess with you if you think you know God's plan. And I know this is messing with some of you, and I, I'm sorry, not sorry. I'm not sorry a bit, because here's the thing. We get this idea. We know the plan of salvation and systematic theology, and we've got it all figured out. 
except this scripture here says that God changes his mind. I mean, check this out. It says, on the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. And the people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast, and they put on burlap to show their sorrows. They took off their fancy clothes. They were rich. The king repents. They dressed up their pets in burlap. I mean, that would have been a great scene to see. Like, they were big time repenting. In the end of chapter 3, we find it says, When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and he did not carry out the destruction he had planned. See, that sort of messes with your idea of God, doesn't it? It doesn't say he knew all along they would repent. It says, man, he changed his mind. That's not something we think about God, the creator, doing. Changes his mind. But right here in the story, we find a God who controls the winds, a God who controls, creates leafy plants and worms and great fish and all of these things. We go, he's completely in control, but yet he changes his mind or maybe not. Because 160 years later, we find the prophet Nahum prophesying against the very same city. They're back to their old ways. In fact, they've taken over most of Israel by this point. And this is where I was saying earlier, understanding God gets really complicated because he's eternal. Like everyone from Jonah's time was already dead. Nobody even remembered that time. And then here's the prophet Nahum saying, this is what the Lord says. Though the Assyrians have many allies, they'll be destroyed and disappear. Oh, my people, I have punished you before, but I will not punish you again. He was talking to Israel. Now I will break the yoke of bondage from your neck and tear off the chains of Assyria because the Assyrians had captured Israel proper. And this is what the Lord says concerning the Assyrians in Nineveh. You will have no more children to carry on your name. I'll destroy all the idols in the temples of your gods. I am preparing a grave for you because you are despicable. This is 106 years later and it happens. And in the 1800s, we have excavated, not me personally, but we have excavated Nineveh in Mosul, Iraq. In fact, if you heard on the news a few years ago that ISIS was destroying relics, ancient relics, do you know what some of them were? They were actually some of the temples from this time. Uh, For the fish god Dagon, ISIS was blowing them up. And when they first discovered Nineveh, it's such an interesting story because they were excavating in the desert. This was back when the, uh, the, the British were excavating everywhere. It was like Indiana Jones and they're excavating and they thought they found a road and it was so wide. I forget how wide, it was like over 20 feet wide and then they begin to dig down and the road goes down and down. They're like, this is a weird road because it's 20 feet up in the air. That was the top of the wall of Nineveh. Said you could drive chariots, multiple chariots. It was like a highway around the city. What a strong city it was. Yet we know from history that the Medes drove in there and just destroyed everything. So thanks to Jonah, <laughs> we understand exactly how God works, right? Or, or not. And thanks to this Bible that we have, this collection of of books written by different people over thousands of years, we know exactly what to do in life because it's God's little, no. Um, I do think that we can say that things happen for a reason and the Bible helps us understand. Now understand that just because God can doesn't mean he will or he will do in your thing, but you can go, you can, you can pray more intelligently when you understand things like that, like, God, I'm repenting, I'm sorry, I've messed this up, can you rescue me? It just might happen, I've seen it happen. But forgiveness is not a time machine, he might not. But there's so many things like this, like we can understand a little more of God's plan, so I'd recommend you read it, and I'd recommend you read all of it, because it's amazing. But I want to read to you once again what God said through the prophet Isaiah. This is what God said about himself. He said, seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. 
Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. The rain and the snow, they come down from the heavens, and they stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It's the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all it w- I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Yeah. I'm going to try to sum that up, <laughs> and it's almost impossible. I've changed the wording of this a thousand times this week because I don't even understand how to sum up what God said there. But there's some pretty important stuff in there, right? Like instead of thinking, okay, I know how God works, or hey, I've read the Bible, or I read at least part of the Bible, or hey, I've heard a talk about the Bible, so I know how God works, I know what he's gonna do. I don't think any of that is a great plan for living. I would say seek God's plan. Look for it, listen for it, and and, and realize when we read a story like Jonah, we go, oh man, that was great. I bet a million things happened like that. Probably didn't. That might have been the only time in Jonah's entire life other than just, you know, being a prophet and saying what God told him to do. That might be the only supernatural thing that ever happened in his entire life because that's the way life works. I find in my life, like, I've seen things that I cannot unsee like I've seen supernatural things that I go I can't unsee that I know God is with us I know like the starting of this church is a miracle and I heard another story the other day um, (laughs) about how people prayed for this property about eight years ago and prayed that God would do something on this property and change it and here we're sitting in it so I I have seen so many things I shouldn't say I haven't seen a lot of things like that I've seen a few things like that I've seen a few times in my life where I've seen God God heal people. I've seen a very few times where I've seen God actually just move in a way I couldn't overlook, but most of the time, not so much. Most of the time, it's a week like this week where I'm like, where are you, God? This is not working well at all. And thanks for the snow. (laughs) Right? But I think the best thing to do, you know, he said repent and turn from your way and we think of that as being all heavy but basically saying leave your ways that don't work and join mine. I want the band to come back up. I can't wait to hear them again. Wow, I was like sausage and simple man. I'd take that at my funeral. That's amazing. But I think we should seek God's plan because I think it's the best plan. As he said, my way works. I mean, God was right in every one of those when when the people repented. He's like, okay, you don't get destroyed. But guess what? They went right back to it. And after all these people were dead and gone and had forgotten all about what Jonah said, well, guess what? God allowed this amazing power that ran the world to be destroyed because he's God. I say beyond just seeking it, it's not good enough just to know what God's plan is. That's why I would read scripture and that's why I would listen to sermons and that's why I would explore things. And, but try to be a part of it. Find a place, that's, that's what he's saying. He's like, you're not gonna necessarily understand, but, but if you wanna prosper, you should try to be a part of that. So that's what each one of us should do and that's gonna be different for everything. So you and, you and I could go through our whole life not trying to think we know everything God's going to do, but just go, man, if I can see something God's in, something God's doing, man, I'm going to try my best to be a part of it. But my warning for you after reading that scripture and sort of living my life so far, I'd say don't assume that you know what's coming next. Man, Jonah had no idea. I love the fact that Jonah throws a fit after the people of Nineveh (laughs) repent. He's like, I knew it. And he actually says, kill me now, Lord. It would be, you know, and it's like we find all the time these prophets like yelling at God and, and, and going, kill me now, I dare you. Moses said that, Jonah said that, you know. So I think one thing we could take from scripture that is very valuable is you and I are probably not having the right conversations with God. We're probably going, bless my family, give us traveling mercies, whatever those are when I go on a trip. Help me to do well at school today. 
These guys were arguing with God. So I want to pray with you. I just don't want you to get to the end of your life sort of like Max did and go, you know what? I was there, I saw the whole thing and I was wrong because I thought I knew what was going on. Because my ways, God would say, are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. Dear Lord, we are grateful for your plan for us and God, we wouldn't even begin to be arrogant and ignorant enough to think that we know all that you can do and that you are doing. God, even in this church. God, we're grateful for the supernatural things that we've seen and we do not deny them and we don't even begin to try to explain them. But God, we have no idea what you want next. And we pray that you would show us and you would guide us. And God, I pray everyone here would begin to think about like what is your plan for their lives? Be with us. Give us your wisdom and we're asking for it now. In your name we pray, amen.